Hello and welcome to another We Virginians Commonwealth Conversation. I am Ryan Gilcrest. We're joined today uh, by a couple of experts on something that maybe everyone doesn't quite understand uh, and certainly maybe doesn't understand just how important it is uh, to the functioning of your local governments uh, and for government transparency. We're going to be talking a little bit about FOIA laws, a little bit about uh, how open records laws might be affected by the coronavirus crisis. And to do that, uh, we have Jim Lemonian with us today. Uh, he's an entrepreneur and executive. Uh, you might remember him uh, as a uh, former delegate. He served in the Virginia House of Delegates from 2010 to 2018, representing the 67th District. Jim, welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, we also have Glenn Proctor with us today. He's currently uh, founder and training director of Red Jobs. Um, he was also a longtime newspaper editor uh, and the former executive editor of the Richmond Times Dispatch. Glenn, glad to have you. Thank you. And joining me as always is my co-host Marisa Porto. She's the Hampton University executive in residence and a former newspaper editor and publisher. Uh, everyone on this call is intensely familiar with open records and government transparency and FOIA law, but maybe not all of our listeners are. Marisa, how do we uh, want to get started trying to lay plain for our listeners exactly why this matters right now? Okay. Well, let's, um, let's ask our experts uh, a little bit about FOIA law. So, um, Jim, I know that you uh, were once the um, ed ed chair of the FOIA Council for the state of Virginia. So perhaps you can set the stage for us and tell us a little bit about why um, open records and open meetings are important, in particular at a time when we are facing a pandemic. Sure. Well, the, the uh, open records law, the Freedom of Information Act that we have in Virginia and many other states and certainly at the federal level, uh, came about a number of years ago because of citizens' concern that decisions were being made in government without public input and maybe, you know, maybe not in the public interest. And so this was designed to make government transparent and to allow citizens, the news media, really anyone to hold public officials accountable in the work that they do. In Virginia, our Freedom of Information Act really has two parts. One is related to open meetings make sure that they're announced, the agendas are announced, people are able to attend, and then separately access to records. So government documents that may or may not have come from a meeting, they may have been working papers that were uh, developed in the process of decision making, not just by government officials, but by uh, government employees of any level. All of that is, is uh, open to uh, uh, public inspection with, with very few, but a few uh, exceptions related to guarding the privacy of private citizens. For example, tax returns are not available for public inspection. But at, you know, at a time in an emergency, which frankly was never anticipated in Virginia law, we didn't put some provision in the code to say, when there's a pandemic, here's how everything works. That's just not in there. So this is, a, this is new ground uh, in a lot of respects as, as, as other matters of public policy. But what's important is, is government still needs to function. They can't function normally. It's gonna to be tough to allow people to attend meetings for government officials to be in the same room at the same time for obvious reasons. But at the same time, a lot of decisions are being made on the fly and you know, people need to know what's going on. I mean, we've, we've seen in the news, um, some contracts related to um, material to fight COVID-19 that maybe were not done through the proper contract channels were passed off to some pals and buddies and uh, not in Virginia, but in another state I'm familiar with. So that's the kind of shenanigans that can happen, unfortunately, in a time like this. So even though it's tough to have open meetings and open records, in another sense, you kind of need it now more than ever. Glenn, you once ran uh, one of the largest news organizations in the state of Virginia, um, the Richmond Times Dispatch. Can you tell us, um, in this unprecedented time, what you what you think about what's happening in the in the in the Commonwealth as far as that, as the reacting to open records and open meetings in a, in an emergency like a well, I've talked to some of my colleagues 
at the TD and, uh, you know, and they share um, the, the concern that Jim just mentioned. Um, too many contracts are being let for supplies. Um, too many meetings are being held uh, by telephone or just a few uh, legislators or council members getting together. And in that way, the uh, public does not know what is going on. And um, again, to, to co-sign Jim, this time is more important than ever because, uh, because of where we are and the money that has to be spent by not only from the federal government all the way down to the counties and the cities, um, you know, to overcome this situation and to overcome the unemployment and the closed businesses and getting everybody back on their feet. So for us to do this, the public absolutely has to know. And, you know, I know my colleagues at, at the TD, I can't speak for the other um, institutions in, in Virginia like, you know, you folks can, um, but that's, um, you know, that's it. I am familiar with what's happening in Jersey and Kentucky and some of the other states, and they're fighting the same battle. They're filing a bunch of uh, FOIA um, requests to uh, make sure that they're able to get some of this information. Because I know New York, especially, although Cuomo has been pretty open, um, they're, uh, you know, they're really pushing because they're spending a lot of outside money on contracts. Right, right. And, and as I understand it, there are some states that are suspending uh, the length of, of time that it is required to, for a government to respond to requests. And Jim, um, we talked a little bit about that um, previously in our, in our earlier conversation before the video, but perhaps you can talk a little bit about your, um, you know, what you think about what will happen in the pandemic to public record requests or FOIA officers? Um, is there any concern there in, in what could happen if the states find themselves in financial um, straits, which some of them already have? Sure, sure. Well, in, in terms, there's sort of a near term and then there's a the longer term. I mean, in, in uh, where I am in Northern Virginia, government employees are working remotely. And so that's clearly going to be tough to file a records request. I think the meeting announcements and things like that, um, you know, the meetings can't be held in person by public officials, but the announcements is fairly routine. It's done online. Uh, that, that should be okay. And, and clearly if, if there's a circumstance where government needs to act to save people's lives, they're just going to do it and worry about the other details, FOIA and otherwise, later. And certainly, if, if I were in that position, that's, that's what I would do. But you can't abuse that. That's, that's the risk here. Uh, longer term, I think we're, we're aware that, that at the federal, state, and local levels, the revenues are taking a big hit because of income tax and other taxes not coming in because people are unemployed. Businesses are not operating as they were. And so when, when it comes to reckoning time with budgets, uh, what happens to the, the people that, that handle the FOIA requests? Do they, do they have you know, assign different responsibilities? Are we gonna see a reduction in, in employees in, in different places in Virginia or at the state level? And if that happens, then what happens to the responsiveness of requests for records, for example, uh, or other inquiries that, uh, that uh, FOIA officers, which all our localities have, um, you know, how are they going to be able to respond if the budgets get cut? So that's a longer term thing that the legislature and local governments are going to have to protect. There's been a lot of controversy uh, in, the, in Virginia about uh, transparency when it comes to where the hot spots are. Um, there's a the, the discussion has centered around uh, long term health care facilities, although there um, there's been part of that discussion is also centered around um, you know, meat, meat packing plants and that sort of thing. I wonder, if, uh, Glenn, if you would talk about um, your con any concerns that you might have about transparency in, in when and where there are hot spots um, and, you know, the, the sort of discussion between balancing HIPAA 
um, and privacy with FOIA and, and the public right to know? Well, I mean, taking HIPAA into consideration, you know, I appreciate, but as all of us know, this is an unprecedented event and none of us were living, you know, that are living now, most of us anyway, have never been through anything like this economically, socially, um, emotionally. And so, so we're going to have to put some brakes on some things uh, because for hotspots, you know, I mean, I'm a veteran and I know a lot of the VA hospitals are having a lot of problems and they're also not being forthcoming in terms of uh, telling, you know, other veterans and telling, you know, the public or the veteran population that is served by these facilities what is going on. And so, um, you know, as, as you know, a lot of people have talked about not only states, but communities and the federal government is a lot of different changes are going to have to be made under this extreme and dire circumstance. And HIPAA, transparency, FOIA, all of those things will come into play and some of them will have to be looked at much, much differently as we go forward. As we get into this, uh, in the middle of this time where most boards and, and councils have found some way to web conference to hold their meetings, um, we run into all sorts of issues about how they're announced, uh, the amount to which the public can access them, technology issues. Now, as you mentioned, Jim, government's just kind of doing what it has to do at the moment. But when we get to the other side of this, there's going to be, need to be some consideration uh, for situations like this in the future or other eventualities. What can we do to ensure that if we hit this again, that there is something in place that allows the public the access they need and allows government to be expedient and move forward with, with having meetings. Is there anything we can do and, and what type of policy changes might be needed there? Well, I, I think there is, and I would imagine certainly no later than the 2021 legislative session in Richmond, where we're gonna see a lot of bills introduced to address this in different ways. But uh, I think overall, we need to look at it, and hopefully these pandemics, you know, we, we don't deal with this again. There's always the possibility this thing comes around uh, another time, like like what happened, as I understand it, in, in uh, 1918, unfortunately. Uh, but to have some um, some statement in, in frankly, in a number of parts of, of the Virginia Code, including the Freedom of Information Act, that, that says when the following things happen, then certain things are triggered to put into place to make sure government can respond appropriately in an emergency way, but also do it in a transparent way, and most of all, not have to make it up as we go along. Now, I'd, li I'd like to think, and I think it's true, most government officials I know in Virginia you know, are, are uh, enthusiastic about the Freedom of Information Act. They're enthusiastic about transparency. What we can be doing over the next few weeks is, is watching to see you know, how, how often do they take the opportunity to be transparent and to ensure that the decisions are open to public view, whether they're required to or not at the moment, or whether they have all the right technology at the moment, are they going the extra mile when they can to be transparent and, and to show the public what's going on and how the decisions are being made? I think that would, would speak a lot of those public officials that, that, that do that. Um, but to your point, it's, it's going to take some, some thinking. I don't know off the top of my head, you know, what the X, Y, and Z, what, what the checklist should be going forward, but it's, it's probably going to be a long one so we can anticipate scenarios, whether they're health-wise, you know, epidemics like we have now or, or other things that just prevent meetings from happening in person for whatever reason. And what triggers that? I think you look at what the legislature passed just a couple of weeks ago, there are budget amendments one that's effect until the end of June, one that's, that's in effect after July 1, let's say if the, if the governor issues an, an emergency, state of emergency executive order, which he has, then there's certain things in the FOIA, among other parts of the law, that get waived. 
Yep. And so under what, under what circumstance are you allowed to waive certain provisions of the FOIA Act and which ones? Well, that's something we've sort of been making up as we've gone along here the last month or two. The Attorney General weighed in with a generous opinion on what the governor can do. Okay, fine. He's got to kind of work in a tough environment right now like we all are. But going forward, that's, that, that's an important question that the legislature should decide and not, not leave up to uh, the view of a particular future governor, a particular future attorney general. Right. And, and Glenn, in that vein uh, that Jim was just talking about, you know, we, we all understand in times of crisis that certain things are going to have to be figured out as we go. But what's an acceptable amount of leeway here? What's, what's a reasonable tolerance um, for government in situations like this and and how long can you expect uh, that tolerance to go on uh, before it becomes uh, stretching out a crisis what what do you think of that uh, well planning I mean you know just like for this whole situation whether it's statewide or or federally you know we absolutely have to have plans in place. It's interesting that, you know, I'm here in Charlotte, but I've put together a whole planning document for three organizations, one here and one in Minnesota, and um, or two here and, and one in Minnesota. And basically, we haven't gotten into the FOIA thing because these are corporate, corporate environments, but, but just planning documents and it it appears to me and it should appear to all of us that in a lot of situations counties cities states or the federal government did not have adequate plans in place for some of what we're facing and you know as a former military guy planning 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 is absolutely paramount for something that may never happen or something that may happen every year, like a hurricane or a tornado or flooding or something like that. But planning is the key. Jim, uh, with your previous experience as the chairman of the uh, FOIA Advisory Council, uh, looking back on some of the discussions that the council had while you were the chairman, what, what are some of the um, sort of digital discussions you had at the time that Good question. That, that looking back now, with the pandemic here um, and the and the and the changes that have been made, just to deal with the emergency, sort of seem a little bit old school to you. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, there's been for the last few years this question of how we bring in technology related to open government. And, and it's a two-edged sword. You can use it to further open and make government more transparent, and you can do some other things with it too. Um, I mean, we've had issues, uh, you know, the, the emergency concept in the FOIA law really to date has been based uh, about you know, a public official who needs to attend a public meeting and gets in a car accident, or, or is, it's snowing and drives into a snow ditch and calls in and, you know, are they allowed to participate in a meeting by phone in that situation so we worked that out and how many times you can miss a meeting and be there by phone and make sure that things are recorded that the meeting notes still reflect you know there's, there's those kinds of situations but what's different now is is the danger isn't the weather a snow drift or a car accident it's getting the people together in the first place right and so that's what's that's what's different that's what no one ever thought of when we were thinking of okay how things could go wrong related to FOIA and, and for that matter, I'm sure in a whole other range of governments. I mean, it was mentioned, you know, hurricanes, tornadoes. We know they come from time to time. We've sort of got that down on what happens when that happens. But um, ne ne this just never really crossed anyone's mind. Mm -hmm. It does beg the question, too, uh, as far as public meetings. How do you, how do you allow for, uh, public, for public meetings where there's citizen input? Um, and, and what does that mean? Um, and what does that look like you know, long term if there if this if this situation continues for a, a period of time which it appears to 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 be um, what does having public input at a public meeting that's now digital look like um, right. 
one of you, either one of you could, could try to tackle that. Wow. Yeah. Go ahead, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you just how how would you get say you say you were having a, a county board meeting on Zoom like we're doing now? How does someone be added to that conversation? If maybe maybe if there's ten people who all want to participate, how do you know? How do they know? How, how's the meeting? The people running the meeting know who they are and let them in one at a time so they don't all talk at the same time. Um, I mean, there's sort of, you could put a clock on them as we do at some meetings, you know, somebody's not going to come and, and, and talk for five hours on a, on a Thursday night that we, we get that, but, um, that's, that's all the kind of thing that needs to be figured out. And of course, if it's on zoom or through Facebook or through, you know, WebEx, the other, you know, who owns the, the, the copy of that video when it's done, is that property of the local government? And if so, how, or does that just stay in some cloud? data center somewhere in the world uh, operated by Facebook. And if someone wants to access it, does Facebook release it or not? You know, all of those things, um, they're, those kind of questions probably coming sooner or later, but, but now that we've had to live through this and continue mm -hmm. to live through it, I think those questions probably got to be answered sooner. It, it, it begs the question about um, what are some of those potential public policy um, legislative potential uh, legislative proposals what are they going to be, look like in in january do you have any do you have any guesses jim since you're the, <laughs> the person who spent the most time um putting together pr proposed laws yeah I, I think that the most important thing is going to be what triggers the exception to the rules so once you have to once you say okay we can't do it the way you know the law requires we've got to do something different we can't put everybody in the same room for example you know for a pandemic reason or any other reason okay but what threshold of emergency has to happen and what circumstances trigger that because it really needs to be a high threshold it can't be something that's abused and it can't be something that's murky that then is going to end up with a lot of litigation so some courts get to decide really what that answer is at some point in the future and I think, you know, what the, what the legislature did a couple of weeks ago was probably more or less necessary. So if the governor is going to have an executive order, certain provisions of, of open meetings, the way they're required to be held in law, um, are going to have to change. We get that. But can the governor keep the executive order open for another year, even if, even if everybody goes back to work and everything else, could a governor, not this governor necessarily, but any future governor say, you know, I'm just going to keep that open for a while, have my own standard. And then all of a sudden people are denied access and government sort of looks a lot more opaque. So th those are the kind of thresholds and standards that I think are probably uh, as important, if not more important than, okay, once that's triggered, then how is it going to work? Because you're only going to be able to imagine so many different circumstances you're not going to be able to imagine them all. And the technology is going to change. I mean, we think it's cool right now using Zoom. You know, five years from now, there's going to be something else. Right. Nobody's thought right. of yep. it, you know. Yep. So uh, I, I wonder, um, is there a place, um, and this could, uh, this is a question for either one of you, um, what, someone who's been on one end of the FOIA Advisory Council and someone who's actually been the chair of the FOIA Advisory Council, is there a place right now for the FOIA Advisory Council to try to, to get ahead of some of these discussions and maybe think about that now um, in preparation for the January session? That's a good question. Because, <laughs> excuse me, Jim. Yeah, I just uh, wrote that, I just wrote ahead. that down. Um, is there a place where the council can put together a draft, you know, for the legislature to to get an advanced look at. And so when they come back in session, it'll be something that's really um, embedded in their mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's right. I think there's a great opportunity for the FOIA council to take the lead and as as you know it, uh there's there are uh legislators who serve on that as well as private citizens who have a particular interest and knowledge about foia so i mean if, if this isn't 
what FOIA is set up to do, then I don't know what FOIA council is set up to do. Because th this is this is ready, ready made for that kind of imagination, leadership, and recommendations. Because I mean, frankly, legislators you know, they're dealing with a hundred other issues or more. Right. They're not all experts. Don't have time to be experts, and and frankly, welcome uh, most of the time when a when a council like uh, the FOIA council takes the initiative and makes well thought out recommendations, vets those with hearings and and uh, external uh, opinion, and, uh, and and can work with the executive branch, the governor, the attorney general, so that you kind of you get some kind of consensus before next January. And hopefully have the bill that everybody says, yeah, that's the bill that's going to fix this FOIA thing the next time we have a pandemic, and then it just passes. So there's a way to kind of line that all up, but it takes time and it takes planning, and you know, I I, I think you got to start pretty soon. Yeah, uh, perhaps uh, perhaps someone will watch our discussion and um, and and take it to heart. So and on that bright note, I I think we'll call it a wrap. And I'll say thank you to both of you for joining us today. I appreciate having um, your insight from both sides of the, of, the, of the FOIA perspective. So thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Good to be with thank you. Thank you. Uh, we appreciate everyone who's been watching. Um, thank you so much for your time. Uh, if you made it this far into the video, we'd appreciate it if you'd give us a like. Uh, if you enjoy these and want to see more, uh, please subscribe to our channel. Uh, we plan lots more of these discussions uh, as we go through this time period where a lot of things are changing and uh, it helps to understand what's going on in the community and with our government. Um, again, thank you to Jim Lemunyan and Glenn Proctor. We appreciate your time. Marisa, good to see you again. And for all of you watching, we'll see you next time. Thank you very much.